visit us all too soon. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we need any more pictures of Mr. Seagal anytime soon. Not good for the heart. Anyway, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Smudcast number seven six eight. Anime's obsession with Europe: a brief history. And just before we started the stream, we were talking about this video or the the concept behind the video, and we don't think it's specific to anime or writers of anime or manga. It's simply the popularity of, let's say, gaming and and fantasy that have taken the tropes that have just become popularized or easier to digest than, let's say, other mythos and how they translate into gaming and, man- and manga and other stories. So princesses and witches and wizards and knights, all that um, 16th, 17th Renaissance style era of mythos that came from Europe, from Brothers Grimm, popularized and then made into giant novels that we see in Tolkien, and that made popularized even more. That's pretty much it. It's nothing specific to people in Japan making anime, I think. That's just my my take. I could be wrong. We could have some really cool writers from Japan, and they're going to interview. He's going to get some excerpt from an interview showing that, no, no, they actually love love European history more than their own culture or Asian culture or whatever. I well, for Japan, I wouldn't say that. For China, maybe, because Chinese fantasy doesn't make sense, and it's always the same three characters, which is really strange for that giant, yeah. giant country to only have like two or three stories. Yeah, they've got all kinds of lore, they've got all kinds of philosophy they could work with, and I don't see too much of it recently. I, I mean, there obviously is some out there, but I haven't uh, I haven't seen any renaissance, let's just say, of Chinese stories in the past 10, 15 years, outside of that one space one, whose name might just escapes because I haven't watched it yet, about... Uh, Sorry about the problem? That... Uh, that or is something a, else. That is a very popular one. I was thinking of Spaceship Earth, I think. Okay. Yeah. But the three-body pop... I, I thought you were talking about classic ones. Well, in the past 10, 15 years. Like, these are novels that just okay. came out, and they're sci-fi. So I don't know if that counts for being part of Chinese part mythos. Of Chinese. Okay. Hard to say. I think for the mythos, you would go into the into all the old stuff. And that's just the journey to the West, um, the... Three kingdoms and the water margin. Then what? Yeah, Which... you have yeah you, you have you have some random stories with magical snake appears and uh, government bureaucracy. This and, and uh, it makes no sense. It's just it's just there. It might be due to the the all the revolution stuff and things like that that the culture Maybe. has been heavily controlled. Maybe the, uh, we don't know how much the Cultural Revolution destroyed, because it's bad. It's gone. It's like uh, the Library of Alexandria. I honestly that thought that Smud was talking about the Peach story for a second when uh, he was referring to the spaceship one. I thought that's that I remembered. It, that I remembered it was a Japanese story. I was like, oh. Well, the only modern retelling which is again from the ancient uh, epics of china the, the water margin is the game coming out is is from the team who made the suikoden games in konami they obviously got fired everyone from konami got fired and they had a kickstarter it's coming out this month it's called yudin chronicles so that is basically suikoden but their non konami version of it so that could be the most modern thing i could think of from china that's bigger. That's based off what they're known for. I don't know. Uh, Roman- Genshin Impact. Ge- uh, mm. <laughs> Genshin Impact, I know, has chi- has China influence it, but I don't know if it's from China. It is from China, for fuck's sake. Well, te- technically, yes, but we're talking but about. I, I, I was I the, the, the Japanese, joke I was making I about it was that it just it just every every land is a country with its own references. The first I had released was European inspired. I would then they had st- Japan, I think. Yeah, I would still argue that... No, again, first they had, they had China. China. They had China. The, the most I knew about Genshin Impact was China was telling... Um, Vent was not allowing Venti to come back at any point until somewhat recently, I, th- I don't know. That's all I knew about Genshin Impact. What a helpful... Besides the fan base. 
I would still argue that kind of game is based off popular tropes in gaming for MMOs or any online gaming. Not necessarily Asian architecture, Asian stories, um, mythos. I don't see it there. I, I, I played it for maybe an hour. I could be wrong. There could be some storylines like that. But it, uh, it felt like your generic fantasy MMO to me with a lot of, obviously, anime in, influence of, this, of the art style. But that's just my experience. Anyway, this is a long video, about 25 minutes, and we should get started. I'm curious to see what he has to say. So, let's go. 1974, Heidi, Girl of the Alps, Ooh. aired on instant global sensation. Still seen as a masterpiece today, the show told the story of a young girl named Heidi, who is sent to live with her... Yes, uh, Switzerland commissioned this anime from Japan, Studio Ghibli specifically, uh, which you can see in the, in the entire style of it. And Heidi is based on Swiss literature. Uh, a crazy philosopher could tell you more specifically about Heidi, but this is like many other things, uh, like, like a couple anime from the time they were commissioned from European countries to have good children's TV. And this is one of them. Sent to live with her grandfather in the Swiss Alps. Here, she gets up to all kinds of adventures with Peter the goat herd, her dog Joseph, and her rich friend Clara, all while squirming her way into the heart of her grumpy old grandfather, and in turn, us, the viewing audience. If you're old enough but not familiar with the show, you probably live in either the UK or the US, two of the few places that the show didn't catch on. But across Europe, the Middle East, South America, South Africa, and Asia... Th this is kind of like Rin Tin Tin. Everyone's heard the name Heidi before. It's like a household name, and you may not Everybody know... Everybody can sing the intro. Yeah, you may not have read it or remember much of the story, but you, you, oh, it's that girl with her living with her grandfather in the Alps or some other mountain range doing things. Like that's, it, it, your brain just goes to that. You just don't remember the stories themselves. This show is a huge hit. As someone who grew up in India before moving to the UK, I have incredibly fond memories of watching this show even in the 90s. And my family still nostalgizes about the days that I watch innocent shows about little farmer girls and not violent anime featuring gratuitously <laughs> big boobied ladies. But what neither they, nor I, still nor most the of time. the viewing world realized at the time was that this was an anime, one of the first truly global anime. And one of the leading figures involved in its creation was a then unknown Hayao Miyazaki, who would go on to create an animation house by the name of Studio Ghibli. The creators were in fact so keen on telling this story authentically that Miyazaki himself went on a scouting mission to Switzerland and throughout Europe to make sure they depicted the environment and characters as accurately as possible. Yeah, uh, 20 years later, um, a delegation from Nintendo would do the same to lay the groundworks for Ocarina of Time. Yeah, this is what any studio, whether you're making an anime, a video game, do. do. This is what we saw with New Vegas. They went down to Vegas in, that, in the areas of the the desert just to get a, a feel for what <coughs> it could do in the future. So they had landmarks and various things and hotels they slammed together. So yeah, they want that authentic feel even though you're creating something brand new. Um, Wisp, if you don't mind me asking, uh, where did uh, Nintendo send delegates to for as inspiration for Ocarina of Time? Mainly southern Germany. Schwarzwald area. Cool. あの、いわゆる場面性。宮崎駿はですね、ただ見ても合ってるんですよね。景色なり、あの、来ている。ただ見てる。それを彼は一生懸命記憶して、あの、判定取り入れた。But why was this 1970s anime made in Japan? so keen on retelling an old Swiss children's novel. I mean, the original story is from the 1800s. And why do so many anime from then? Because many stories from, well, eight, the 1800s, they still hold up today. No, no, no I already answered this. Oh, either that, oh, The public, the, the state TV stations of several oh, European you. countries and Canada commissioned cartoons made from Japan, just anime, based on local literature. 
That's how we got the Moomins, how we got Maya the Bee, how we got Alfred Yodokus Quack, how we got David the Kabouter, and many, many others. I don't think I ever saw those. Or... Well, uh, Maya the Bee was for Germany, the Moomins are Finland. And very difficult to find uh, the Japanese dub of that, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, yeah, uh, Alfred Yudokos Quack is the Netherlands. Netherlands had another one that I keep forgetting the name of. It's a comedy on a farm with funny farm animals. Uh, with a big bull who's the farmer and uh, his annoyed friend who's a tortoise. Um David the Kabouter is a, uh, for Canada, is um, a gnome who lives in the forest and he is a judge. And when the animals have disputes, they come to him so he can rule. Wow. Yeah. It's very wholesome. Okay. There are, I think, I think there are two versions of that because I always mix them up. There are two uh, David the gnome thingies and I, I never bothered to figure it out. At the same time, um, Phileas Fogg in 80 Days Around the World was made with animal characters. Um, that ran a lot. I think that was one of the Benelux countries that ordered that one. And one that is very famous in Spain and Brazil or Portugal. I don't know. I, may, I have not checked whether any of them commissioned it. it was a wonderful anime about uh, Treasure Island. Absolutely stunning atmosphere, quite dark, despite the added little cute animal companion that the main character got. But that's it. Tons of cool stuff at the time, and all commissioned from the West. That's when that's when our um, our media, our state government, if you can, if you want to go that far, actually cared and want to provide good children's entertainment. That is wholesome and maybe has a few morals in them because you usually have one because there's a little bit of conflict, a tiny slice of life conflict, and it gets it resolved. Gets... I miss when media had good entertainment. Uh, when do you think the last era was for good entertainment, Wisp? Early like... 2000s. That's the end. Probably. All right, two minutes in. Yeah, of, yeah uh, just one more thing out of all of those uh, that you have uh, pointed out with the only ones I really remember are Women's and Maya. I think those were the two uh, out of all of these that actually got into Poland properly. The rest were. Uh, yeah, no, they never were translated. Ow! So, oh, I'm sorry. Is someone stepping on someone's toes there? What's going on? Are you apologizing to the wisp? Anyway, let's continue. May now, and especially now, with the likes of Attack on Titan, Vinland Saga, and Free Rin, all seem to have such a fascination with Europe. I mean, it's not like in the West, we make loads and loads of shows. Set. I, I think this is cherry picking, and there's just so much anime every season. Uh -huh. You can't just say, well, these ones of uh, uh, you know, German or whatever influence. It's like, sure, that's fantasy in most, general. Yeah. Yeah, most most anime happens in Japan. <laughs> I, yeah, but this is, I mean, we could I could pick uh, a whole bunch of other very popular anime. It has nothing to do with fantasy, and it all occurs in Japan. It's like that's totally normal. So if you go by ratio, they make as much about uh, European stuff as as the West makes about Japanese stuff, because you have the occasional uh, last samurai and something like that. It's just not it just doesn't happen that often. And since um, the socialist activists have shamed everyone into, oh, you can't do cultural appropriation. Uh, that's that's when kind of the exploration of other cultures uh, was hindered a bit, let's say, and to bring that closer to kids. So we have to rely on the old stuff that we hopefully have all bought and on the shelf. Okay. In Japan, only the odd film or TV show here and there, and they're almost never based on retelling authentic Japanese literature or folklore. Usually, they're just white guy ends up in Japan stories. But in anime, 
Europe or fictional places that are substitutes for Europe are such a common setting that you probably didn't even think about how normalized that is until I just mentioned it. So what's going on? Where did anime's fascination and maybe obsession with Europe come from? I think it might be because anime is pretty much... It's more the... How do I phrase this? They're interested in other cultures because it looks new to them and it looks fascinating. Like how some cultures look fascinating. Like the best example I can think of is, you know how America has a lot of weeds that are obsessed with Japan. I'm thinking that it's something like that as well for other cultures. That's my hypothesis. You are actually correct because to, from the Japanese perspective, we are the exotic ones. We are the exotic foreigners with the exotic foreign stories and landscapes and fashion and all of this. To, to Japan, this is all, especially when these things were made, completely novel and strange. The, the same way that old Japan is strange to us. European knights and castles are strange to them. It's that simple. You'd be surprised at how easily something new inside a community can get interest. Like... Something as innocent as a Burger King around a place that didn't have one would get people immediately going there just because they're like, ah, oh, this is new. Might as well and then go. they never return because they realize they only sell shit. <laughs> Hardee's is the best fast food place. I know there's a, there's a bunch um, of anime I've been watching just the past few months after the, the winter season ended that have nothing to do with fantasy or European settings or... European folklore. So it, this is, again, this is very small number in comparison, and I can give you a full list. We can go over it. But mm -hmm. it's it's mostly Japanese. It's mostly rom-coms and high schoolers in Japan. So uh, it, this is very specific. And this is, and that, like, Freyron is, is one of the outliers just because it was such a well-done manga that said, oh, we're, we're just going to translate this into... An anime, uh, so I don't see the big deal about this, but he's cherry picking, so definitely, definitely. Uh, on the cowboy uh, thing, I would just just as I wanted to mention it, Tyler. Well done. Um, there are Japanese quasi weebs, just inverted, that are completely obsessed with United States cowboy culture. The same way that you have these these weird cringy anime fans in the West that, ugh. well, yeah, that's how it is. Yeah, and there's lots of mythos. What was that wonderful spiel about that girl getting angry about all the mythos that she didn't understand because it was all foreign to her in some anime? Is she from Tumblr? No, no, no. This is actually part of a show where she they're part of a club about. Uh, I don't know what the, the the club was exactly about. This is the show I can't remember, but it's a very uh, famous uh, rant. She she starts talking about all these things, and she's performing them because they're acting them out, and she doesn't know what these things mean. Like, why do you use them? And this was the whole rant. But every time you see a, a fantasy story in in anime or manga that has um, some bizarre compound name of some aristocrat. Like it has like the the, the Wurzner or some sort of Schweizer, some sort of German sounding name that I've never heard of before. It's like, is that a real name they might have used? Probably not. And this is if you pronounced it right, you know, it, this spelling doesn't even look familiar. I'm like, is it, what is this word? I, I kept trying to find. Is this a, a name of a girl or a boy? I couldn't find it. So Schweizer means dude from Switzerland. Oh yeah, because. In German, it is called Die Schweiz. Well, the one that I, I was referring to is called Loop 7, and that came out this year. And it's, again, fantasy, European look. Like, let me just find the name. Here it is. You can pronounce that. That'd be great. The what? Rische Irmgard Weizner. What go. the fuck is that supposed to be? The only thing that exists of this is Irmgard. Okay. That's an ancient Germanic name that I would have to look up what it means. Right. So I don't mind using made-up names, but if I don't know the reference, if I don't get it, then it just sounds like some generic fantasy European thing, and I don't know what it's supposed to mean. 
Like I want, I want like a, a Snow White. I want like a oh the the pure it's virgin. Not, it's not most most German names. People don't know what they mean. Oh yeah, there's no reference. <laughs> yeah, because uh, the the old Germanic and the uh, current German have not that much in common. Um, if you can find some com some connections, if you look at at Norwegian and Swedish uh, or Danish. And then you can and you can reconstruct some things if you if you have nowhere to start from. For example, um, the city of Hamburg, after which the Hamburger is named, originally means Burg is the castle, and Ham has no meaning today in German, but in Swedish, Ham means port, so it is the port castle or castle port, the reinforced port. That's what hamburger means. So basically, you're all Americans. You're always eating. You're not eating a hamburger. You're eating a port castle, which is kind of funny. And then you have names uh, like um, obvious names like Wolfgang. It's the first. It's a, it's a male first name, Wolfgang. You can guess in English relatively easy. It means the one who walks like a wolf. And then you have other names that are a bit more bit more obscure, like Uwe. It fell a bit out of fashion. It's sometimes coming back a little bit. Uwe is the old Germanic word for bear. So technically, if you look at all, all these old names, the way they worked, and you translate them into modern language, they work exactly the same way as the Native American names. You know, I was just like who dances with wolves and stuff I, like. That. I was just suddenly reminded of Record of Ragnarok, which of course has a, a Norse basis for the premise of gods versus humans, but it just takes everything. It takes whatever mythos stories from all over the world and just throws them together in a battle royale. So it's it's fine. You can do stories like this. Is it fun? Is it entertaining? I don't really care where the mythos comes from, so long as I can understand the reference. All right. Uh, oh, this is uh, interesting. Mimi Mundus. Hey, Mimi Mundus. Thank you, sir. Uh, Miyazaki, by the way, made a comic about the Otto Carius, the famous German World War II Panzer Ace. Okay. Which is very strange because Miyazaki hates war. It is obsessed with make, putting war into everything. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe it's his uh, a side job or something. He, he needs the money he needs to get his priorities straight. <laughs> he was young; <laughs> he, had to get, he had to pay the bills. Oh, when he was young, it was still cool. Uh, get all the jobs you can get. I guess I don't know. Who knows? Uh. It's a bit of a long story, so settle in. Nowadays, when we think of weebs in the West obsessing with Japanese culture and fetishizing the allure of Japan, we often make the mistake of assuming that it's a one-way street. But Japan itself has long been Whoa. fascinated with Europe too, in its own way. Before we talk about anime, we need to talk through some important historical That's good context. That was really good. For those who aren't aware, Japan went through a period of isolation from the rest of the world called Sakoku, which means closed country, and it lasted over 200 years. During this time, which spanned from the early 1600s till the 1850s, Japan didn't allow any Europeans or generally foreigners to enter the country except for some limited trade with China and Korea and one singular Dutch trading post in Nagasaki. While this was a time of great cultural growth for Japan, Sakoku ended in 1853 when the US arrived with warships and demanded that Japan open its borders and then force them to sign the hilariously named Treaty of Peace and Amity. After this time though, in what is known as the Meiji period, Japan once again opened its borders and set about to furiously catch pace with the rest of the world, having realized just how far they had fallen behind the western powers. With this came an influx of technology, literature and science into Japan, particularly that from Europe. And European fashion, fashion became trendy and European culture became a point of fascination. It is in this context that a lot of Japan's prominent media developed, particularly its films and eventually comic books or mangas. An easy mistake to make would be to assume that the Second World War is the cause of anime's fascination with Europe. But 
no evidence but it's from funny. Me in the literature I read, and I've been researching this topic for like two months now, backed up that idea. It is an obvious conclusion to draw that Japan being allied with Germany would somehow make it fascinated with German culture, but if you stop to think about it just a little bit, you'll understand why it's not true. Germany didn't suddenly become fascinated with Japan after the World War. Why would it? The alliance was purely militaristic. There was no exchange of cultural ideas, and there was no time for it. There was a global conflict going. There was also no actual interest by the Nazi ideologues of that because they thought themselves as better than everyone else. So why would they want an exchange with something they thought kind of okay and better than the other rebel, but still inferior to themselves? And we're, and we're talking about a span of about a few years while they're busy yeah. fighting wars. They don't have time for cultural exchanges and, and an era of art and culture to inspire them to do non-war things i don't know um a little different when you're in europe and you're germany in world war or in between world war one and two and you're you know trying to take yeah. take it over it's not uh not a priority yeah right? yeah but he, he is right that in in so far at least that it wasn't a positive alliance it was one of necessity as these are the countries that are left over outside the allies was the term axis that's defined by by the US that was not defined that was not self defined so oh. the belief that the axis powers were uh, super working together is complete nonsense they were just that's the countries that are not in the allies that's that's what that is if i remember correctly as soon as um, they got done taking as soon as the axis power or yeah as soon as the Axis powers got done do planning, do taking over everyone else, they probably was uh, going to attack each other, right? Because they they were all they only liked each other for the power, and they hated each other afterwards. Why the fuck would Nazi Germany attack Japan? They yeah. it's on the other side of the globe. How do you even ally with them? I mean, you could technically get your submarines all the way out there. It's possible. <laughs> it would take a long time. Oh, God. It was more that, well, remember, Hitler won, like, the perfect race. He didn't want, like, anyone that wasn't a part of it. That, that was just what I was thinking, that, you know, he would have... Why are you always repeating what I just said? Anyway, we're five minutes I, I think you're saying... Because I honestly think you're saying something different when you're when I use more casual terms or try to use more casual terms. Uh, that's a you problem. Anyway. Anyway. Okay, we didn't suddenly become just because we were allied in the war, nor Russia. Instead, Japanese film and media developed itself during and after the war, with animated cartoon films being used for war propaganda and also for entertainment. They were massively influenced by works from all over Europe, particularly France and Russia, but had its own style and Japanese grounding and influences too. The medium slowly evolved into the styles and aesthetics that resemble what we would now recognize as being anime. Eventually they became a commercial product with manga being purchased by thousands of people and with television those stories began being converted into TV shows which is when the boom of anime really came through in the 1960s and beyond. Oh, that's that's canon for the 60s is when anime started to find a lot of commercial success both in Japan and abroad in the US and Europe. First with Astro Boy, which was the first anime film to be released in the US, and later in the 1970s with Space Battleship Yamato. Here's where we start to see the establishment of a certain trope that would follow in a lot of anime thereafter. The adventures of young male protagonists in conflict-oriented worlds, which we now see as a staple in shonen anime like Naruto, One Piece, or My Hero Academia. But it's Isn't this like the case for every media that is made for a young Boys, that the popular elements know. are then inspiring new, new media. That uh, because it's popular a year ago, we can make something new that people would like as well. Yeah, I think that goes for, for yeah. anything though, not just media. Yeah, I, I find it weird that he is assuming it's 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 a Japanese staple to to have a story from, you know, going with a young boy going on an adventure. That just seems weird to me. 
Yeah, pre pre universal that that idea. Uh, a young man coming into the uh, adolescence or adulthood, your adulthood, uh, coming of age and learning lessons. Yeah, no, it's you take any setting; it's pretty much throughout the world universal thing. That is also a part of many fairy tales where you have a male protagonist. Um, oh, and I just noticed in the bottom left corner, he's actually listing what, what is on screen. Uh, I just didn't see it right away because I have the uh, Watch Together UI over over that. But yeah, that's that's good work. More people should do that. Actually, show Joe anime where our interests lie. Stories about ah, young women ah, are ah. the female audience. While young boys enjoyed space operas about intergalactic war, young women in Japan were much more interested in stories about people, everyday interactions of love, jealousy, and friendship. And this is where Europe comes into the picture. Since the beginning of the Meiji period that I spoke about earlier, young women in Japan were already fascinated with European fashion and aesthetics, and early shoujo anime reflected this, the large number of them taking place in European settings. But one fascinating and surprising reason why early shoujo anime set their stories in Europe was that it allowed them to explore otherwise forbidden themes, such as homosexual love and female empowerment. As legendary critic Frederick Schott writes, Foreign settings create an exotic quality with storybook scenes and fashions and allow heroes and heroines to act in ways that are not always socially possible in Japan. And where did that get us? A example of this was The Rose of Versailles, a manga which eventually got turned into an anime and is set in the French royal court, just before and during the French Revolution. Initially, the show follows the biographical story of Marie Antoinette, the last queen of France, but soon pivots to the real main and fictional character of Oscar Francois de Jaget. And this is the point I would acknowledge that I'm pronouncing words in like four different languages. So please forgive me if any of my pronunciations are way off. Oscar is a young it's woman who was good. raised as a boy and a soldier by her father who longed for a male heir. Oscar becomes captain of the Queen's Guard. And although she openly identifies as a woman, her masculine demeanor and androgynous aesthetic create for various gender defying and homoerotic subplots. Oscar's first romantic intertwining, for example, is with a female character named Rosalie who falls for Oscar after she saves her life multiple times. But Oscar rejects Rosalie's advances, stating that she wanted to be in a relationship with a man, not a woman. In shoujo anime, it was very common to explore such romantic interests between women, so much so that it had its own term, class S relationships. These were not usually sexual in their nature, but still romantic friendships between women with intensely strong emotional bonds or admiration for one another. After this failed situationship, Oscar then encounters two different male suitors, one who sees her only as a man and one who sees her only as a woman, both of which prove exceedingly frustrating to Oscar, who wants to be recognized for her whole self. Eventually, Oscar falls in love with her lifelong sidekick, Andre, who is himself an androgynous figure, and by the end of the story, cuts his hair to look similar to Oscar's, and indeed, by the end of the show, they look very much alike. Oscar even describes Andre as her shadow, and the fact that they're both basically the same person is again a nod to the homoerotic elements which were a normal part of the genre. It was this ability... It's also a show and an implication of a dysfunctional relationship where one person becomes the clone of the other and gives up his own character or hers. It's usually what you see in bad relationships. Well, when you have a romance of any kind of nature, you're going to have some conflict between the main characters and the... And, this, and the other primary characters. So it's not unheard of to have it just be purely romance. And then, oh, let's have this, was it 15th, 16th century setting of people on horses and sword fights? So it's like you got to put the conflict where it belongs. So let's make it romantic. Let's make it sexual. Let's make it without actually being about that. It's there. But we can't actually do that in the story. So that's not unheard of. And uh, this is not unexpected, I would say. It's definitely more adult than you would expect, though. ...dynamics of sex and gender, which made sure there were Japanese girls at the time, who were able to project themselves into situations they otherwise wouldn't be in. Male homosexual oh, love, no. for example, <coughs> was fairly common in shoujo Sorry. anime, because the idea of men having sex was considered a lot more normal than thinking about the sexuality of women. On top of that, The Rose of Versailles was also politically very bold and inspiring, with the main character Oscar becoming so disillusioned with the corruption of the French aristocracy that she joins the Republican rebels and fights to overthrow the monarchy, eventually dying in battle for the cause. These progressive... She becomes a communist! <laughs> 
because she couldn't eat cake. I mean, good riddance with Marie Antoinette, but communism is not an improvement. You gotta love a story that tur that has a hero turn into a villain at some point. It's not how it's depicted. I know, but you said the person the became a communist. Made the Rose of Versailles so popular at the time that according to critic Deborah Shamoon, when the main character Oscar died, teachers reportedly were forced to suspend classes because all the girl's students were in tears. And one angry fan actually mailed a letter containing a razor to the artist who wrote the manga, Ikida Ryoko. So we see here that early on in anime, Europe represented a foreign setting where characters could behave differently to what the norms in Japan allowed, while still speaking very much directly to Japanese audiences. This is a theme that would continue on in the 70s as we approach the era of Miyazaki. Yeah, but we, we do the same here in the, in, in the West yeah. when we depict foreign, uh, foreign cultures where we know these things happen and they themselves don't talk about it because it's indecent. And we do have, we have our indecent shit, but we have no problem depicting the indecency of the other cultures and therefore express the link to our own. That's just what everybody does. This is no different than, let's say, Disney taking any kind of story and saying, I like Greek mythos, let's make a rom-com action for kids story about that as opposed to having for kids the genre is for young adults or young women it's i, I see it no different it's for american children the audience is what they're targeting yeah obviously they're have, have we told a story about the hercules movie uh the clash of the titans uh influ influence? No, no 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 uh when disney made the the hercules movie <coughs> um sorry gas in my stomach when they made that, they wanted to premiere it on the Acropolis of Athens <laughs> oh, geez. in Greece. And so open air. And you know what Greece said? I can imagine, yeah. Fuck off. What <laughs> the what is wrong with you? What is this movie, you insulting pricks? I'm paraphrasing. Because, well. The way the Greek pantheon on the Greek story, the, the Heracles story, is depicted in that movie is absolutely nonsensical. No character, as amazing as the character Hades is in that movie, he has nothing to do with the real guy. Zeus, Zeus, Zeus has nothing to do with the real guy. He's the polar opposite. In the movie, he's depicted as a loving family father. That's probably the greatest insult you can you can make to to the greek mythology because zeus is everything but a loving family father that's why they also uh, streamlined uh whitewashed disney washed um how hercules came to be in that movie and how he got his powers yeah that's Disney. Because though. it's completely not it's complete nonsense. The Disney, Disney is an insult to the world. I wouldn't say it's an insult. I'd say they make it more consumable for general audiences, so children have no general problem. audiences. No, they, they they make it more consumable for the level of retardation that <laughs> they think the U.S. population is. I see what you're saying. Okay, yes, the a lot of the folklore from geez, from Greek, from Roman, from Oh geez, the entire Brothers Grimm is is very dark, and very violent. So they have yeah. to they have to take out the, the, the dark elements. <laughs> they keep they don't the have to. They just but they do it because they think that their children are all pussies. They want to tell a magical, fun story where has very little action in the form smart, of violence. Smart. We have Taylor plays of the actual Little Mermaid, that is basically a stage play with real life actors with well. The limited uh, the limits of the of the technology at the time that tells the story properly where the little mermaid at the end she doesn't get the guy and she turns to foam well i think it has to do with the fact that uh, this yeah a stage play can you in a stop movie barfing into the microphone it's disgusting i'm not barfing i'm just you are. trying to get my tongue straightened <sighs> 
a stage play and a movie are different from how a person views it. I know this because this happened with Little Shop of Horrors. That's Little not Shop the of point. Horrors had the original stage play where, you know, Audrey kills the main character and his love interest, and everyone saw the actors and started clapping and all that. But on the movie screen, it was different because people gotten a little mad that Audrey 2 ended up winning and or or rather they didn't want to see such a downer ending. And so they, you know, changed it to where it was a more happy ending. And so they don't want to see they don't want to see the actual story because they're pussies. Well, some people want to see something a bit more uplifting. Why do the retards get to decide? Why does this minority of of absolute cowardly, emotionally thin skinned idiots get to decide? Well, this was Disney in the eighties and nineties, or even before that, with the seventies as well. They wanted to have a family friendly animation studio or series of stories from famous folklore that people could say, Oh, I remember Snow White or I remember this or that. And here is the modern version of it, at least the Disney modern version of it, which is obviously not the same. And that is the idea. That was the premise of we have a bunch of mothers who are either single, mo- not necessarily single mothers, or mothers who have to entertain their kids. Or we have a bunch of babysitters. What do we do? We got to keep them entertained and we'll use something that they might have already heard of, but here's a nicer version of it. And that's why we turn the Greek muses into black African <laughs> gospel singers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Fuck you. In the 1970s, a new type of anime subgenre began to emerge, series which directly retold traditional European stories. Heidi, the show I mentioned at the start of this video, was one of the pioneering works in this field and was part of a larger series called the World Masterpiece Theater. This was a Japanese TV show which would take a classic piece of literature and spend the year airing it as a serialized anime. The series adapted everything from the Moomin of Finland to the British classic of Peter Pan. And although it was not originally part of the series, Heidi was later usurped as part of the wider umbrella of the World Masterpiece Theater. In almost all these series, Europe is shown as a land where adventures can take place and children in particular are at liberty to discover themselves and the world around them. And if you're wondering why it was like that case, until recently, Kobus van Staden summarizes it well. There are very few anime depictions of contemporary Europe. Mostly, Europe is treated as a changeless Ruritania where the use of historically European detailing and landscapes designates the setting as beautifully past. What von Staden is saying here is that for anime, Europe becomes an almost fantastical fictional land, trapped in that era when cutesy little villages were tucked away in some lush green part of the world away from the corruption of the modern industrial age and the evils that come with it. This also followed in the footsteps of classic European literature and the trend of Bildungsroman, which means coming of age stories, in the vein of what Charles Dickens wrote. Uh, no. A Bildungsroman is, uh, is educational. It's an educational novel. I think what he means is more of a. If it's a coming of age story, it's, it's weak. I think that rather falls into the term Sturm und Drang, which is. Uh, Storm and drive, literally. I'm also curious why he's picking on uh, Charles Dickens to or singling him out because he wrote all kinds of books, and I wouldn't say they're all uh, they're all the same. They're all the same style. He wrote different styles, <clears throat> but he's mostly known for the Christmas Carol and Oliver Twist and a few others. So, yeah, all turn of the century kind of stuff. Or middle of the century kind of stuff, 1800s, American. Um, and when these these um, these anime came out, that lots of Europe still looked like that. Basically, everything before the internet, the things were so discon- were disconnected enough that you could have your quiet village where you didn't know what the fuck was going on if you didn't have a newspaper. Well, even and. Though- I was going to say, even with the the Rose of Versailles, that was a you know the setting of war, and as much as they have the beautiful giant windows and all these castles and whatever, and the, and the 
cobblestone uh, roads. You know, it's it's a it's a rom com with action. So it's it's not just that. It's all it's this whole story of France. So I don't know. It's um, it's many things. Each story is its own body of work. As same with every writer, they don't just write the same thing over and over again. Unless we specifically uh, focus on someone who only does fantasy or only does science fiction. So I don't know. I I think that you can apply his point of a place being stuck in some time uh, that is untouched by the revol- industrial revolution and stuff like that. You can apply that to Japan and uh, yep. Asia. Uh, the same with the uh, media that we have had in the West. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, um, it's, it's once again, it's a universal point. Yeah. I wanted to bring the counter example um, of uh, Mushishi, which is a wonderful anime that is mostly set in the time just before the modernization of Japan. You have some of those elements slowly coming in, but most of it is the old village almost well it's not feudal anymore but it it looks all the way like that um the unchangeable place with its mystical nature all around it and it's it's a beautiful anime by the way give it a watch it's one of those things where you just want where you only want to watch one episode a day at max oh yeah just to let it sit. i'm not even sure if that's obviously it has a japanese base but the the fantasy, the, the the creatures in it, I don't know if those are Japanese folklore or it's its own creation that has nothing to do with um, any mythos. It's its own it's its own uh, invented thing. So I don't know. Yeah, that, that's a great example because it is a beautiful story. And there's so much happening in every single episode and it's not your typical story. It's not just like beginning, middle, ending. It's like, I'm going to experience the mountain because there's some creature there and you're like, what does that mean? Like, what's going to happen? You don't know. So, Mushishi is beautiful. Yeah, it's one of those animes that you have to watch like 11 episodes to be like, what the heck is happening? <laughs> what is this story about? Well, it's 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 animistic uh, folklore. We could still have that here too. We could tell these stories if certain people and their ideologies hadn't destroyed everything here. Yeah. For several centuries. Okay. Where children confront a cold adult world and learn lessons meant to teach the viewing or reading audiences valuable life lessons. On top of that, the European setting allowed filmmakers to tell a different kind of story, unlike the kinds currently being told to Japanese audiences at the time in more action-oriented anime. Speaking on his time working on Heidi, Hayao Miyazaki wrote that we wanted to create a work for children that wasn't frivolous, and we wanted to break away from the compromised and slapdash television animation shows of that time. In fact, this desire was so strong that it actually ended up taking the animation company that made Heidi, Zuyo Aizo, and ended up running it into the ground financially. Heidi's animators were so determined to make sure that there was lasting quality in every cell and every second of animation that they spent way more time making each episode than was the norm for the industry. Miyazaki refers to making Heidi in a year-long state of emergency and said that it was the lessons that he learned from making the show that pushed him away from television and towards films. It was only then that we came to understand the danger of television, he writes. Television repeatedly demands the same thing. Its voraciousness makes everything banal. We realized that television required our state of emergency to become a normal condition. The only way to have a long-term relationship with television is to lower the level of production quality to one that can be sustained. Though this was obviously tragic at the time, it's also something we can perhaps be grateful for now because it's ultimately what leads to the creation of Studio Ghibli in 1985 founded by the legendary figures of Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata, who had worked together on the show Heidi. As should already be apparent by now, Miyazaki in particular had a great personal fascination with Europe and made several research trips across various parts of the continent, from Wales to Stockholm to several places in Germany. It is these varied influences that would eventually become the iconic Studio Ghibli style, which most of us can now recognize. Which is ironic because they were just showing uh, Spirited Away, which is a very Japanese influenced mythos. I wanted to comment on that. There's nothing European in there except the parents driving in a car <laughs> and they're close. So. If I remember correctly, Ponyo is a European-based one, right? Ponyo. 
Ponyo. Ponyo. I know Ponyo? it's based off the Little Mermaid somewhat. Can't say. Can't Ponyo? Say Ponyo? Yeah, the fishy one. Oh, I'm mixing oh, it up with something, something else. else. Okay, yeah, I haven't seen Ponyo. I'll admit I like it. It's a, it's a, it's a wholesome one. All right, let's keep going. At just a glance, and has influenced so many anime since. But unlike Heidi, where Switzerland was a relatively specific but rural utopia, in Ghibli films we start to see a change in emphasis. Miyazaki uses all these places that he had visited and taken pictures of and turns them into one beautiful amalgamation. For example, if we look at Kiki's Delivery Service, which is one of my favorite films of all time, we can see that the locations and architecture aren't particularly matched with any one European location. Instead, it's a mix of various European aesthetics, but also some fantastical and anachronistic elements, making it hard to place exactly where or what time period the film is supposed to be set in. The same can be said. There's also an uh, there's always an element of uh, Côte d'Azur, Italy and France. It's always the main influence in the in the Ghibli films. Yeah. Of Howl's of Howl's Moving <laughs> Castle, which on top of having magic, of course, also has things like gliders and various steam machinations, which have gone on to massively influence steampunk and basically create another subgenre where a vague hodgepodge Europe is often the setting. Critic Danny Ah, uh, I would want more evidence for this having influenced steampunk. Or of found it? What did he say? Um... I, I mean, he's trying to say it's a hodgepodge of European elements of architecture and style and this and that. And that's fine because he previously said that there is no discernible exact European city or, or town that has this the streets or whatever. But he didn't mention the fact that the planes in war weren't present in the book that he's he's being influenced by. So that's the elements that Miyazaki put into the anime that weren't there before. So is is war what Miyazaki got from Europe when he visited? I don't think so. Uh, so where where is he getting this this element? Because Miyazaki, we know, does not like war, and that's why he put those elements in the story. And you could argue those could be from Japan and his hatred of, of World War II or what have you. So, eh, steampunk? Eh. I am... I will contest that. I think I think he made that up because he likes Ghibli so much, so he sees it as the source for steampunk stuff. Yeah, that's a weird thing to say. I wouldn't be. Hello. What happened? Hello, Mister Jester, are you still there? No, his mic died. Uh oh. Well, we're going to keep on going and keep talking until you get it working. There you are. I was uh, saying that I think um, it did make a little bit of an influence, but not so much that it should be like a footnote, just more like a small, very small sub uh, culture or something. Like, um, like maybe why, why like... would it influence? It is. It would be a, a product of it, and that is everything influencing each other on the way forward. It's not the same as being the foundation of it. I know. I was just saying it was more like a small little subset just sprung from it when they saw it. They're like, oh, this like castle give, is so great. Give an example. I'm just more saying that I think I'm yeah. I think the guy is or correct, but not so much that it should be a footnote. It's more like, oh, there's just a small uh 1.5% of steampunk fans that likes this movie and got influenced by it. That's my No, opinion. not at all. 1.5% is not influencing. That is I'm saying fluctuations. I'm that saying is random that, that is, is random fluctuations. Influencing. I'm saying that's just a small subgroup that might have popped out of it. You are dude, you you are arguing against your own point. I'm not arg I'm saying that he could be right. But it shouldn't have been it shouldn't have been in the video because it's such a small minority that it That's really why isn't. I asked for more substance because I contest that what he said is true. 
it's a bit. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm saying it's a bit of a contrast because you showed Heidi how they were directly influenced, and then they showed later on Studio Ghibli, where it's he even stated there's no discernible influence, just an amalgamation of of imagination and ideas, obviously from the book, and whatever ideas he got on his trips in Europe. So did Miyazaki also do? The influence with this, the the war elements, like what, because that wasn't as prevalent as described in the book, with the the design of the planes and the flying machines, those like weird or, organic things, those giant bombers. So, this is where we're sort of like, well, it's just the artist doing his thing, and influenced by everything. There's no discernible European influence in that regard. So, hard to say. Wright said, this all comes from Paris, the Paris of our dreams, which refers to an elaborately fantasized Europe as seen through the Eastern eyes. This is actually quite funny because this idealization of Europe pushed heavily. Yeah, but that's not Europe. That's Paris or his idea of France at the time. That's fantasy Europe. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that's European. I mean, you could say, yes, per <laughs> France is from Europe, but that's not all of Europe. Come on. Well, Everyone in Europe would be very Paris insulted. It yeah. resulted in a specific phenomenon called Paris Syndrome, which is a term coined by a Japanese psychiatrist to refer to the cultural shock that tourists, particularly Japanese and other Asian tourists, feel when they turn up to Paris and realize that it's not at all as magical as they imagined it to be. It's and 50 nowadays. It oh, God. quite severe mental health problems. But going back to Ghibli films, we can see again the use of Europe as a fantastical, exotic setting which allows for new stories to be told. But there's also something new being done, which is that the idyllic European setting is often corrupted by the advancement of technology. Films like Howl's Moving Castle and the early Ghibli work Castle in the Sky are explicit warnings on the dangers of technology and particularly militaristic technology. While both films start off- Yeah, but that's outside of the purview of this video. I mean, that's just... Miyazaki doesn't like war. We get it. Yeah, I would, yeah, and I would this say, was not the edited. If I remember I, correctly, I, sorry. Yeah, I I would wager that most of the points he makes here in this video are very universal. It can be applied to any media, basically. I remember reading a fact on uh, TV tropes. I don't know if this is any accurate because I know TV tropes is full of crap sometimes. But I heard, I remember correctly that a lot of the technology we have nowadays comes from the fact that war was so everyone was trying to make new cr creative uh, ways for um war technology or something along the lines of that and why would you get uh, that from tv tropes i forgot exactly that, the page it that was, war um, drives technology is it's a fact it's not a trope i was just, I was just mainly asking because i know tv tropes is full of garbage sometimes you need better teachers. I do. All right. Um, yeah, I, I want to get back on the the European slant, and I, I, he's doing so well with, with House with Rose of Versailles. That was a great example, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, now he's getting sort of stuck with Ghibli because Ghibli's so big and so well known. Because it's his it's his main thing. I guess he's a fan. Yeah, that's and that that. Uh, poisons the video a bit. I would, I would want like the past ten years of influence to say, oh yeah, they've been totally influenced by Europe. And I'm like, how, where, which genre, which style of show for which demographic would be purely European influenced, and why they're obsessed with, like, is it the architecture? Is it the words? The, the language? The people? The cost? Like, I want to know exactly. You can't just say architecture. Anyone. Is it the mythology stuff? Because anytime you have a fantasy story with elves, yeah, that's that could be that's traced Western back. Inspired. That could be traced back to the the Prosetta, but he's not going to say that because that would take way too much time to figure out if that were even possible to figure out. That or Tolkien or the next step, which is Dungeons and Dragons, which is where we got Record of Lord of War from those right. who hunt elves and slayers. Yeah, see that makes more sense, and this is why my first argument was why don't we talk about what's popular in the past 20 years and how it has been influenced up to today?
because we can't go say 200 years ago and say, well, you know, we had fairy tale stories about fairies and gnomes and elves. Sure. I'm sure those were present all throughout the world, not just Europe. They're just made popularized and more well-known in Europe. So yes, D&D was influenced by Tolkien, who was influenced by Brothers Grimm. It's like obvious. But where is this obsession coming from? This is what this is like. Why is a weeb a weeb, right? I want to know that. It's like what what does the weeb like? What are the elements of of anime and manga that they're obsessed with? What is that? I want to see those elements. Here he's like, Studio Ghibli guys went to Europe back in the seventies. Like okay, for Rosa Versailles, I agree. You're right. Fantastic. That was fifty, 50 I, I think years the ago. Main, I think the main criticism right now could be summed up with. The video's good. It just needs a title change right now. Uh, we always kind of say that because it, it's not that extreme this time. It's it's more on point. You're right, but it's like it's just that he's it's just that he's stuck with he's, one thing. He's stuck in the in the seventies and in the eighties and nineties, and we're like, dude, give us today. Are they obsessed today, or were they obsessed back in the forties and fifties? To be I'm fair, just... set anime in the seventies and mate to the 90s was pretty good if yeah dang it why do i get tongue tied so easily okay you also need a therapist in idyllic settings these are quickly destroyed by people who use the fruits of human advancement for their own selfish gain. Both our main characters, Sophie and Pazu, respectively, have their lives turned upside down by these bad actors. These, of course, have strong parallels to Japan's own militaristic history. Going back to what we spoke about earlier, after the end of isolationism, once Sakoku ended, Japan rapidly rushed to both modernize its technology, but also its empire, and taking a leap from its European influences, began to invade and conquer various parts of China and East Asia. Rather than necessarily set these films in Japan and make the message more blunt, but also more antagonizing, one possible reason for setting anime in Europe is that it allows the social critique to be more generalized and also one that is more universal. And with so much of this militaristic behavior originating from the European powers, it made added sense to tell these stories in a European setting as well. This again is a major theme that continues in the steampunk genre, where the dangers of technology are often central to the story. And even outside steampunk, the European setting can still offer a great window into those same critiques. Full Metal Alchemist, which is often listed as one of the best anime of all time, touches on these very yeah. themes. It follows the story of two brothers, Alphonse and Edward Elric, obviously Germanic names in the fictional country of Amestris, which is clearly meant to portray a militaristic Germany. In their world, what? alchemy is a science which allows alchemists... Uh, yeah, it is It is World War One Germany. Okay, I never felt that. You never saw that. I never connected with that, no. Well, the, the uniforms are different, but it is clearly... Uh, Germany World War One inspired. That's I don't know. Very, it's a it's a it's a military government. That's the, the Prussian style more or less. I and guess. that they have the they have the King Führer Bradley. That is just an on the nose nonsense. That is silly. But I always saw the alchemists as like the like the priesthood. They're a small little group that yeah. can do amazing things, but they're not a military power. But apparently they have tanks and. At least one. I don't know what else they do. Well, they are they are the military. Uh, all right. They are the no, military no. and the government. And uh, the the alchemists, they're just the the special forces, if you will. Yeah, I guess so. I've never seen Full Metal Alchemist, but from what I've seen, isn't there like some kind of state endorsed alchemists where they had to? It's more like a job thing. That's the military. Go watch the fucking show. I was just asking a question. Go watch the show; it's good. It's like it's like when when uh, Fox guy is here and he keeps telling us that he still hasn't watched Lord of the Rings. I mean, I just asked the question. I was. Just I answered. Asking. We also just talked about it. All right. Anyway, I I never made that connection aside from the the Fuhrer name, which I thought was rather ridiculous. But anyway, 
allows alchemists to transform objects from one form to another, as long as they follow the law of equivalent exchange, which is that they must provide something of equal value to transmute an object like they do. The older brother Edward is recruited by the government to become a state alchemist, which he hopes will allow him to conduct research on returning him and his brother to their original bodies, which themselves were lost during the reckless pursuit of scientific advancement. Uh, side joke, the Nazis did believe in the occult and alchemy by way of Gnosticism, which is where the ideology comes from. So it is even more accurate than you think. Yeah. But the government merely uses its alchemists as human weapons for militaristic expansion, and the brothers soon learn the dark world they've been dragged into. Disturbed by what they see, they began working on ending the current regime and to fix the wrongs they see in the world. As we get closer and closer to the modern day of anime, the reasons for the European settings become increasingly diverse, as we see in examples like this. But the influences of their origins are still also very clear. Okay. Nowadays, we live in an era where the world is much more globalized and easy to access. The absolute domination of the internet over our lives and the ability to travel across the world so much more freely has done a lot to demystify Europe to Japan and vice versa. Shut it so down! Currently, representations of Europe have started to become even more common, though they still follow a lot of the same inspirations we've spoken about already. Let me break down some of the different kinds. We've seen the rise of anime like The Vinland Saga, which is a beautiful exploration of violence, slavery, and the evils of war. The an Meh, the first season is okay, the second one is garbage. Because it, 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 it is so obsessed with Revenge. certain points that... No! No! Torfin turns into a total hyper-pacifist. <laughs> okay. He's traumatized, all right, but, but like, oh god. It becomes it's so, an absolute so doormat in a way. You cannot use violence in any way. Yeah, and he in in this in this thing he convinces um, uh, names, uh, his uh, his his king, who gets the tiniest Griffith copy pasta to reduce his military and just uh, become a more domestic oriented king gives up his foreign lands and that's the end of the danes so he basically convinced um Torfin basically convinced his king to hey let's give up our people and what did you get in britain then the french <laughs> Okay. I hope you're. I hope you're proud of yourself, Torfin. Okay. You don't end war by just wanting to not be part of it. I, I do remember reading a bit of the manga. It was actually pretty decent. So, anime I never really watched. Yeah, the, as I said, the first half is is okay. In England and Denmark, but it's also events of the Danish conquering of England. It features real characters like King Canute and Thorfinn but takes creative liberties with the specifics of their stories. Knut, the show yes. plays with all it. the various traditions we've just spoken about in this video. Much like Miyazaki's works, the European setting in the Vinland Saga allows for scathing critiques of armed conflict and dehumanization, but it also deviates. The funny thing about all these things is when Japan does them and they're not putting all the effort in like Miyazaki does, um, it the the soldiers, the warriors in these in these um, Japanese productions, and that includes Vinland Saga, they do not act like Europeans. They act like modern Japanese people who are all confused and, and talking all the time and then running away. Ah, it's it's so. What's the word? Disjointed. I I wonder if it's because they want the whole what's the word they want Japanese audiences to look at the anime and think oh okay because I know how culture clash can info can can skew some people's in view of some characters if Persona Five was any indication in the states. What are you trying to say? I You're was trying more... to make this the. Uh disjointed deliberately they're just incompetent 
I was more thinking that because the way that the reason they act like anime characters or Japanese characters is so viewers in Japan can identify with them or at the very least see what they're going. No, they're just incompetent at writing them because well, why else would they write the other characters not Japanese? It would be based off the the research and influence that the writer takes from what they learn and mm -hmm. how they're going to tell their own story. And that's how we get issues with like the Norse mythology and okay, how, how much are we being uh, accurate to the Edda? How much are we doing our own thing? How much can we get away with? So this is, I guess, because there's no magic in this story. It's all just people fighting war, trying to get by, that it comes across as, oh, this is realistic. This is a realistic depiction, even though it's not accurate, which is which is fine. You can get away with it if the story is good. Uh, Ego Dreamer suggests the term character dissonance and that kind of goes there, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. All right. But it also in that it is very much concerned with the realism of where it is set. Europe is not a fantastical, magical land, but rather a brutal and unforgiving place. It was this, this scene just now with the soldiers just standing there baffled and not moving. That's how Japanese people stand in front of something horrible like this. The Europeans don't. We do, we do shit. We do stuff. Where murder and slavery are all commonplace. There are real world events that the story has to incorporate and stay true to, so it doesn't play loose with those aspects. In this regard, it's much more like The Rose of Versailles. It's inspired in equal parts by real Norse folklore, but also just the author Makoto Yukimura's personal fascination with the culture. So overall, we can say a show like The Vinland Saga represents the Japanese desire to tell stories inspired by the local... He didn't go very deep into that, to be honest. He left out all the religion, all the Norse religion. He put in some Christian elements later on, but any of the Norse mythology is not there. Tales in cultures. More traditionally, we have. Wait, let me, let me rewind that. I didn't hear what he said. It's inspired in equal parts by real Norse folklore, but also just the author Makoto Yukimura's personal fascination with the culture. So overall, we can say a show like The Vinland Saga represents the Japanese desire to tell stories inspired by the local tales of European cultures. Uh, no, not in general. That's one author. And we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of mangakas every year writing whatever the heck they want. Some of them are influenced by European mythos. Some of them aren't. We're, we can't just narrow one writer and one show of one anime or one manga and go, this is the Japanese reaction to European influence. Like, hmm. No, <laughs> that's a weird way to put it in a, in a, to make a general statement about the Japanese anime producers or makers or writers. That's kind of silly. Yeah. You know what does stand out? There's nothing about Africa, Indonesia, South America. If there were, I think there's, there's one, it might be a cartoon about African mythology. Hmm. And anything else is just happenstance to be set in in anywhere else, or, or because some character is from there. Like um, Hadenochi Gu is is one of those that starts on some island, but they are actually going to to Japan mainland. So even that is. Japan doesn't really care about these other places. That, I think, would, would uh, be a stronger point for him. That if Japan does something outside of Japan, Japanese culture, then they go to Europe or the United States, but they do not go to anywhere else. I'm, I'm reminded of... Uh... I don't know if this is an Asian or, or, sorry, a Chinese or Japanese story. I think it's probably Japanese. What's that Noragami story about a bunch of gods who get stronger based off people who believe in them? And one of them is like a, no one really thinks about him or gives money to donate. Oh, the, one about, the one about named weapons? Yeah, they have like a follower and they're based off 
a weapon and he could summon them. It's kind of weird, but it's it's mostly a rom com with a lot of action, but a lot of mythos. It's in, I liked it. It's inherently Japanese and or Asian. Mm-hmm. So like that's hugely popular. Same with Naruto, and we talked about Mush- uh, Mushishi and. Uh, what was it Spirited Away? Like, there's all kinds of Japanese stories that are popular out there that have nothing to do with European influence. Like Inuyasha from the '90s was hugely Japanese. Death Note was hugely Japanese. I guess I think it was usually. I'm not even sure what the the gods of of Death Note came from, or what they were inspired by. I'm going to assume they came from Death itself, the Grim Reaper. I hard to say. The, the death god. They, Jap, Japan the, believes in death gods for whatever reason. I don't know. The, the whole the whole Shinigami thing. That's all Shinto. That's animistic oh, yeah. mythology. Yeah, and these are huge. The same thing. Same thing we had in Europe with the Germanic and Celtic cultures that got mainly stumped out by uh, the Christianization by the sword, and which is what Tolkien incorporated in part through the Edda into Lord of the Rings. And that's how we got some of that back in modern Western fantasy. Oh. But overall, overall, Western fantasy is is not that animistic anymore because it's the the even the 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 outside Christianization of the Norse um, mythology and religion, that was a process of a, of about a thousand years that changed that from animistic to God focused. Because in animistic um, mythology, in animistic religion, you have the spirits of the land, of nature, of the elements, all of that jazz, of the ancestors, that takes the primary position of importance because that's the stuff you deal with on every day. You have gods in animistic religions, but they usually play second fiddle. That was the case in in Germanic Celtic culture. Like um, Odin and Thor and all of these, uh, and Tyr and all of these other funky guys and girls, they played second fiddle in in that religion because that's not who you deal with on a daily basis the um christian influence over the centuries actively changed that very very slowly to the point where it was more about the gods and once it was more about the gods it made conversion of the um the 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 norse um cultures and the celtic culture easier in Japan, this process has never happened. So they have retained their animism and their Shinto. And and, and that's why we have this still, the, the stories and, and all these, these magical little fairy tales that make sense in by their own rules in modern media. In um, the Native Americans have the same kind of animism. They have gods. Like Manitou is the most well known outside and, and outside their own culture, but their gods too play second fiddle. What plays first fiddle is the ancestors and the spirits of the lands, the animals, the weather, if you will, all of that stuff. And that's what people get so wrong all the time. And that is what is completely absent from Vinland Saga. I just only remember. My surprise, um, the what was it called? Uh, it was a show that that ran for I think four seasons. Uh, something something king. Bonkers, <laughs> but at least they had the the um, they had the the Norse religious animistic stuff more in there, even though they complete completely winked it with nonsense. I was reminded of uh, that other very popular anime. A few years Daily ago. Life of the Immortal King. No, not an anime. Oh, an actual show. I, I was thinking of if I can find of it. Demon Slayer, which was inherently Japanese through and through. I can't think of any specific European influence or other Asian influence. I was completely Shintoistic. So. I don't know. I, I want him to narrow it down to say, because I don't like titles that are so general like this, to make these broad statements like, anime is obsessed with Europe. It's like, mm, today? Who? Which writers? Which genres? All right. 
We are at 1924. Ah, The Last Kingdom. That's what it was. Okay. It was decent. Ending was we a bit rough. anime like Attack on Titan, which although clearly not as wholesome as Ghibli films, is essentially following in the same tradition. It follows the same beats of the European setting being a mishmash of various European countries with Germanic names like Eren Jaeger and the clear Nazi parallels, all the way to the Norse influences for the Titans. But a different reason for the European setting. Yeah, with the big twist where the Jews are the Nazis. <laughs> I wonder if you thought that through in modern anime is actually just the exoticism of Europe. In the popular anime One Piece, for example, we have an entire arc set in the fictional setting of Dress Rosa, which is an island inspired by Spain and Spanish culture. The main villain of the arc, are you Don sure? Flamingo, should tell you everything- Are you sure that there was a Colosseum there? Are you sure that's Spanish or don't you just think Mediterranean in general? You need name which is inspired by the spanish epic there's even depictions of paella and flamenco dancing. oh my god dude but here we still see the general mixing of european aesthetics yeah but this is one piece it, it mixes everything together you can't just say european aesthetics with this one scene they have people the size of buildings walking around what is that influenced by <laughs> they have they have actual jotun in in a few episodes isn't one... We have a blue giant and a red giant fighting for no fucking reason. Yeah, isn't there a, a character that can turn people to stone? So uh, is that inspired by the Greeks as well? Is that what we're going with? Like just random mythos? It happens to be European. Therefore, Japan's obsessed with the Europeans in this thousand long manga that's been going on for decades. Is the guy who wrote One Piece obsessed with Europe? I don't really think so. I think he's obsessed with making manga. And he'll. It, I think it's more safe to say that Japan is using um, Europe as like a tool for writing stories rather than you know obsessed with it. Uh, and, and that, and to that, it's a writer specifically in this story or mangaka specifically being influenced by whatever the hell they could find. If you were a genius to be able to make that much content. You are either pulling from a huge source of experience or you're just randomly finding whatever you can and trying to tell a good story that's coherent following the theme of your premise. So the fact this story has been going on for so long, I'm not surprised they have influence from everything. Because they go around the world to find the one piece. So you come With across an important everything. Part of the Dressrosa arc taking place in a Colosseum, which is of course Italian. So the arc, not the entire story. Thank you. So he's just narrowing it down, which doesn't describe all the other arcs, which have nothing to do with Europe, or unless piracy is is inherently Europe or Euro European, which I doubt. So sometimes it's no deeper than a place to set an anime in. Finally, we have something which is. Finally, we have something which is actually relatively so new animated. in terms of reasons for European influence. Video games. A vast number of anime are set in a European medieval world of adventures and quests. Whether that be digital, like in Sword Art Online, or real, like they are in Freerun Beyond Journey's End. This one is fairly simple to explain, so I'll keep it short. In that the reason so many video games take place in this kind of setting is that they're all Just drawing we get inspiration echo from, you. from Dungeons & Dragons, which is the foundational point of role-playing games, particularly video games. If you want to see that topic covered, actually, I have another video I made about it here, and you'll find the link in the video description. But it's not news that video games are very popular in Japan, and so it's only natural that with the action-adventure RPG genre being so heavily set in this kind of period and aesthetic, that many modern anime would also want to explore that kind of world. Okay, so this is what one of the points I wanted to... I, I had originally, which is defeating his, his premise. It's not about Europe. It's about gaming culture. It's about D&D &D and what people have been into for the past few decades. And yes, that had an European influence, but then we're, then we're saying, well, you know, who invented the first concept of the fairy or the gnome or the elf? It's like, it doesn't matter. It's not European. It's, it's centuries old. And now, all our gnomes work differently. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> the Irish gnomes are different than the Italian gnomes. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah. And a kobold in Germany is something else than a kobold in France. Oh. Or a gnome, or a brownie. True in the isekai subgenre, the fact that the main character is suddenly transported from the boring real world to a new, often literally magical world of knights and dragons like in the show Jobless Reincarnation, which features a protagonist who lives in modern day Japan as an incel type loser you need and that is deeply frame? unsatisfied with his life. But one day when he ends up in an accident and thinks he's died, he actually ends up waking up in a magical European world full of adventures and monsters. And here, he's given a second chance at life. And as we've established, what better setting for a second chance in a magical place than the Europe that anime loves? So this has been a long video. The Europe that anime loves. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about that. That is just a medieval fantasy setting. I think he's mainly just it. going by what is super popular in the West. If he just stopped... we have to, it's a Crunchyroll problem. Um, Crunchyroll has many problems. I'm not sure if that's part of them. If I were him. I would have brought up Lupin. I would have just had a, a demographic, right? Show show the the mod like today, like right now it's the, the spring season of anime, just started last week. But look at this stat you can probably get the stats from winter that just finished and say what were the biggest animes that people watched that season? And then you list them and you go, Okay, this setting is in a European magical isekai. Great, we got it. Thank, thank you. You're right. I think you're you're onto something. And then we go Demon Slayer. Oh, that's ancient Japan. Okay, we're wrong there. And you just go down the list and you calculate. Okay, forty percent of all the genres had to do with the setting regarding fantasy, European castles, knights and dragons, whatever. Great. And then you go. Am I correct? Is this right? And then you go to the subgenres. Oh, it's a it's a gaming world. Okay, so it's not necessarily purely a realistic world like Freyrin. It's a fantasy simulation gaming environment, which has nothing to do with the influence of Europe and everything to do with the influence of gaming. Which just tends to be influenced by European fantasy because that's where the genre came from. Right. But you have you also have many MMORPGs that featured cultures all over the world. Uh, that was the case in EverQuest. That was the case in um, Vanguard. Very underrated MMORPG. Uh, the, mainly because all the good ideas that World of Warcraft had, it took from that one. And it was a Richard Garfield MMORPG, I believe. Right. And I think if you go into that, you want to go even further to figure out that demographic, you would see most of the players in the world who play MMOs, for example, are from Korea. And we say, okay, what are the biggest Korean MMOs? <laughs> and there's all kinds. There's Maple Story, I think you guys have heard of. Uh, Lineage, Lineage 2, uh, Ragnarok Online, another one, uh, Blade yeah. and Soul. Like there's all these, it, it, are those European inspired? Maybe, I don't know. I have to, I have to I would have to elements research that. Of them, elements of them, but they always have their Japanese elements in them as well. Right. So it's no... I mean, that's even the case for El Sword, which has everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, every... Uh, even uh, Baldur's Gate 2 had, like, Japanese armor and weapons that you're like, what is, where did this come from? This is this is Europe. Yeah. How, how are we getting this stuff? Yeah. So there's no... Because Yoshiro or whatever his name was, the, the bloody traitor thief... Yeah. Yoshida. It's from a different country. That's not the Sword Coast. Right. So there's there's always been an amalgamation in gaming, in manga, in anime. And unless you have a very specific pattern that you've been observing for the past, I don't know, season, year, decade, two decades, saying, wait a second, why is every fantasy story taking place in Europe? And then you come to the realization, oh, it's not. It's just gaming. It's the influence of gaming in the past 20 years that's caused us to take the D&D &D and extend it to MMOs and have all yeah. of our, our media about that. It is no longer, a, the, the premise you have, your hypothesis is no longer relevant. Because it looks like you have a 
bigger variety of stories we have told and can tell still mesh together anew from the elements of um, European, mainland European um, history plus fairy tales plus whatever magic we put on it. While Japan, probably through its, its isolation, um, has let fewer stories to tell in general because it is it is just for centuries stuck in a in a fashion of the exact same you could argue the same for um, the european medieval type centuries but there was just much more going on here and much more interaction with the world at large and where where Japan just had these these unification wars similar to China. We had the Holy Roman Empire of Germanic nation <laughs> made up of, 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 I don't know, 700, 800 little kingdoms where you spit in the wrong direction and you, you no matter where you stand and you spit into the next kingdom. That's where you get this whole story, this whole idea from that there's always another castle with another princess who's been married off to some other guy she doesn't want to because that's what it was here. Yeah, I, I see this as he's trying to say that, let's say, anime was, was influenced by Augustus Caesar, with the first, first Caesar of, of ancient Rome, when really it was influenced by some other... Caesar, like, uh, I don't know, pick one, Titus, like 100 years later, like Hadrian. And Hadrian made a piece of bread that everyone loved called pizza. And that's, now we have all these pizza subgenres that, or whatever, whatever the influence was. It's like, yes, that one guy did the one thing that became its own thing in D&D &D and gaming. And that's where we're getting the fantasy setting, which is influenced by. But it's not actually because of Europe. But Margarita made it fashionable. Uh, fashionable. There, there's a good term. I think that's the, the the right verb we're looking for there. It was fashionable to have fantasy settings in a medieval style world. There we go. It's an adjective. Fashionable. I think it was more it's fashionable to experience something new compared to what you ex compared to the land that you experience in your day to day life. It's yeah, but pizza was not new during. Um... <laughs> Queen Margarita's time. I was more it referring was that to it the... Was, it, was, it was food the poor ate, and I she made it fashionable because she wanted the best pizza baker to bring her a pizza. And he made it. And it was a very... Because, well, what do you put on a pizza for a royal? Uh, was... it, might offend, it might offend the royal. So the pizza Margarita is extremely simple. It basically has nothing on it. And she I loved was... it. And because the queen loved the pizza that was then named after her, all the royals started to eat pizza too. Because, well, when the queen eats it, then we must too. That's how it became fashionable. I was more talking about how Japan was using European stories for their anime. Not about the pizza thing. All right, all right. Let's keep going. We've got two minutes left. And you personal journey for me to investigate something that's been on my mind for a long time. Namely, why so many anime are set in Europe. Ultimately, the relationship is complex and has a long history and origin, which hopefully I've done my best to elaborate on, but obviously has far more steps along the way than I have the time to get into or even the resources to investigate. On top of that, something I haven't mentioned yet is the commercialization of anime. Ever since what? anime started wait, becoming wait, wait. TV products and That's potentially sold topic. to European markets, its relationship with Europe became obviously more involved. It Not really. That... Not really. They don't give a shit. They don't give a shit what we watch or like. And that's good. If you're making an and you want it to have a more global appeal, but you might set it in Europe or borrow from European aesthetics to make the show more watchable to Western audiences. But how much Not we should read into that is a matter of heated no. debate between academics. That's why... Oh, that's why that's <laughs> why all it. the kids are crazy over Dragon Ball and, and Naruto uh, and One Piece. I, I really don't think academics are going, well, I wonder what anime is going to do next to make us interested in it. It's like, no, they don't ask these dumb questions. That's why the Cal West is so of Demon Slayer as well. Speaking 
and specifically shout out the academic article by Oscar Garcia Aranda and the mammoth book by Jonathan Clements called Anime History, both of which were amazing resources for research for this video. And I'll be providing all my references in the video description. Okay. In my mind, there's a... Then there can't be that good books if um, this is the video that came from it. <laughs> and I think it's a video is a good start for the topic, but... Um... I don't think it's the finished product. I think it's the first draft. I don't think we could on. we could blame the authors of those books. It's his interpretation and what he what he gleaned from that because it sounds like he cherry picked exactly what he wanted, and says, "Well, look at this mm -hmm. beautiful example of European architecture." It's like, yes, you're not wrong. And again, I will give credit to him for the House of Versailles because that was accurate. You get a good example. They did research on that. You're right. You know, but is there always going to be a, a journalistic take on how an anime was made where, oh, yes, and we, we went to the Arctic and we ins we watched the polar bears for two weeks. So it's like, okay, I mean, if you want to tell yeah. a story about that, that's great. But I don't think that's how it works anymore. I think it has been so manufactured. Uh, well, every studio is different, but it has been so manufactured for mass consumption that we have literally manga and anime for everyone. There's a story out there for everyone, not every season, but every year there's gonna be a, a rom-com you're gonna love, an adventure yeah. you're gonna love. Anime, anime works not because it is aiming for a wider audience, then it wouldn't work. Nothing that aims for a wider audience ever works. Anime works because it does its special niche thing, and some of these niche things are so damn good that everybody wants to watch them because that is what really appeals to the wide audience. That is quality. Quality in is also, every way. That is also is why there are so many niches. Yeah. yeah. It is I just um, remembered an anime he could have mentioned in this video for something involving uh, yeah, something involving Western media. Why didn't he mention JoJo? It has like five parts specific. Let's see one. It has five parts at least involving Western. There was um, Europe, which is the first one. New York, which is the second part. Part three is in Japan. Part four is in Japan. Part five is in Italy. Part six, I believe, is that in Japan or is it in Europe? So, well, it's the same reason why I mentioned people. why I mentioned Lupin because Lupin goes all over Europe every season, plays in a different country mainly, and the uh, the other thing is is he brought up some a few good examples from the seventies and eighties. He missed, I'd say, eighty percent of all the important ones, the other important ones, and he did completely skip over, probably because he never stumbled upon the information that all these things were commissioned. They were actively commissioned. It wasn't that Japan suddenly wanted to make um, European anime for Europeans for specific countries. It's that they were actively commissioned, and that's why they were made. So those you could, could make the argument that maybe these countries, these, these governments commissioning this stuff for their kids' TV did have a big influence on what would be made in Japan because these things would, of course, also run in Japan. That would be a much more interesting argument, but I guess he never, he, he, did, he didn't know. He didn't find that. I feel as if his, his research ended with the, the isekai genre and said, oh, wait a second, I have to think about that. I don't have time. This video is too long. <laughs> Let me I, just run I, with it. I'll, I'll be more forgiving and say that I think he thought his point was good enough, and that's why he didn't go more into it. Because <sighs> yeah. when something can go on and on, it can get tiresome, but I think he could have explained it better. All right, well, we got a minute left. We're almost done running through the development of anime's relationship with Europe, starting with the general cultural fascination amongst Japanese people, to then the use of Europe as a place for speaking on taboo topics in shoujo anime. From there it evolved... So, Europe has taboo topics? Or they use the European setting to express taboo to That's a weird thing to say. I, I use exotic different cultures to express taboo topics because I can't do it in my own setting. <laughs> Uh, Wouldn't expressing taboo topics in another culture be just as bad as using uh, your culture for the taboo topics? Well, you'd have to know the actual culture very well to do that because you can't just 
tell a different story outside of the norm unless you know how to do that or if you know the experience of that. So to do that, meaning you know the culture, you know the language, you know the nuance of that particular flavor of, let's say, homosexuality in France, in the 1600s or wherever this took place, it would, it would be take more effort because you were unfamiliar. It's also done in the past, so you have to guess. And of course, this is all fictitious, fictitious so it's like, all right, so she's masquerading as a boy, da 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 and connecting all the dots during war times in France hundred year, several hundred years ago. Like, uh, th- that would be more difficult to, to make it come off as believable. But it's seen more as an art piece because it's never been done before. It's in the 70s. The animation's actually pretty good for the 70s. And uh, it it tells a story that people aren't expecting. So, uh, it's a weird it's a weird comment to make. It's <laughs> let's talk about cannibalism, but in Africa, like okay, maybe. Well, that's what happens. <laughs> like, that would at least make some sense. Yeah. Oh, Haiti. Oh. Of European folk tales and children's stories to the Ghibli model of a fantastical, magical Europe, which also leads to the industrialized steampunk themes that offer a chance to make social critiques. This is Finally, we have itself, the modern yeah. era where all these influences kind of mix, and we also get the addition of video games. So, is it modern or is it the 70s and 80s, dude? What are you talking about? This is just word salad now. Which bring with them their own fascination with medieval Europe in particular courtesy what the heck are we looking at of Dungeons and Dragons and other role-playing games so there you have it I hope you've enjoyed this video because it has truly been a labor of love and if you have really then please like and subscribe and share this video so that it can reach a wider audience also if you'd like to support me directly head on over all right that's good enough for me start off so well and then just (laughs) yeah needs to do some more research here okay Let's see. I liked it a little bit. It was it was a it was a okay at best. He put it well Weird. enough together, but the 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 actual premise just fell apart. All right, it's meme time. What do we got here? April the eighth. Yes, sir. All right. On subject of reference pictures, Tintin creator Herg Herg. Actually went to Switzerland. Had Had went to Switzerland to get reference pictures for locations. Oh, that's cool. Oh yeah, good stuff. Yep. I, I miss the hand drawn anime of the night nineteen nineties. I really do. And you must watch Frieren. Wisdom. Also, also JoJo didn't. It, oh, Chaos Jester. It's. Fu- it goes part one is in England, part two, New York, then it goes into Switzerland, then it's part three, cross cross country trip to Egypt, then part four, Japan, part five, Italy, and then part six is in Florida. Not, not whatever. I didn't watch part six, all right? I, I, I was we, more talking about where they started. Ringing bell. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you showing you were showing the Davida Kabauta. I just mainly mentioned JoJo because I know that's a really popular anime. I mean, it was a manga first, but okay. Well, I I know it's a manga first. I think all manga. I think most all. I don't know if all anime had a manga first, but a lot of ma- a lot of anime has a manga first. There's Lupin. Has the gang travel all over the world by Italy, Brazil, England, etc. Yep. Yep. <coughs> also, one of the two of the movies are done by Ghibli. Oh, this is cool. Uh, Lost World, Metropolis, and Next World were some of the earliest works featuring steampunk elements which have since consistently appeared in mainstream manga. Cool. Uh, Death Note Shinigami's designs process. Oh. Uh, Felt that the design process was very difficult since he started with nothing. Obata said that at first Shinigami appeared like beasts and later designed them to look like 
crustaceans and insects because it was easier. <laughs> uh, based on the one wizards, but decided against the idea and that the rags on some Shinigami serve as a remnant of that concept. Oh. No real design motif and that he never settled on any concrete appearance leading Shinigami realm as changing appearance in each instance of Death Note and it sometimes appearing to be a dry field and sometimes as a room full of bones says that he likes to think of it as an abandoned building with chunks of steel sitting around. Wow, that is weird. Oh my God. Oh Jesus. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm going to skip that. Um... That's why they're losing the manga. Ugh. There is monster comic piece of garbage nowadays. Monster takes place literally in Europe. You're right. In Germany. Doesn't uh, Berserk but the, take place monster in Europe? is extremely accurate about Germany at the time and place. Down to the down to the Schlecker trucks yeah. that don't exist anymore because that company went bankrupt. Uh, Smud Boy, I know you're a fan of Berserk, but doesn't Berserk also take place in Europe somewhat? Or something Fantasy. inspired by Europe? It's... Don't ask questions you aren't prepared the answer for. <laughs> I'm just asking. If we're talking about a dark fantasy, uh, most dark fantasies do use a European slant, so it's kind of hand in hand. Don't ask questions about Berserk. Read Berserk. All right. That was, you know what? It was a good put together video. It just the, the content and the argument just fell apart, unfortunately. And I did, I did appreciate the start. The Heidi example and the Rose of Versailles were very good. And I think if he stopped there with his, I, with his original premise and went, wait a second, I could be wrong. Let me research this more. And he goes, wait, it's not just Europe. It's everything in the past 30, 40 years as a result of video games and D&D &D influence. So then we'd be going... They've already tried to something new. <sighs> yeah, and plus if he narrowed the scope of his title to anime's obsession with Europe in the 70s, great. I'd be all behind that and then he could just keep that video to eight minutes long or whatever. It'd be great. So, alas... <laughs> Anyway, that was that was Anime Monday. Pretty good. We got an anime one. It was long. It was decent. It uh, it wasn't annoying. It wasn't absurdly yeah. stupid. It wasn't uh, adult in the sense of being perverse, which is always nice. So I appreciate that. Thanks, guys. Um, Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, it was fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, you guys take it easy. Uh, hopefully the weather is great wherever you are. I know it's a bit weird transitioning periods between seasons it's freezing one day it's hot and windy that's just april weather that's yeah. why it's called april fools because the weather fools you all the time it's uh it's fun and i'm i'm arguing with a bunch of uh what do they call climate activists <laughs> about if the if the temperature goes up five degrees we're going to have exploding atmospheres or whatever like um it, it goes up 60 degrees every year and down 60 degrees every year in Canada. It's called seasons. It's, it's not It's not going to change anything. <laughs> if it goes up five more degrees, we'll have exploding anuses. Oh, yeah. Anyway, have yourself a good one. Thanks for the video. We'll talk to you soon. Good night. <laughs>